Hey everybody, it's Magus. Thanks for coming back for a September 2023 Tesla Solar Panels and Powerwalls monthly update. We've got a fun one for you this month. We have had our system for two whole years now officially in September, so I'm going to take this opportunity to do a fun little segment on financials. I'm going to look at what we've paid for our system in the first two years, what we've received for our system in the uh, past two years, and I'm also going to take a look at what a new solar system would cost today versus what we paid two years ago. Stay tuned. A little backstory on our system for those that are new or maybe just joining us for the first time. We have a 12.24 kilowatt array with three power walls that were installed in August of 2021. Now all our panels are east facing on one roof face. Uh, so we actually have two Powerwall Plus units with two inverters. So we have a 7.6 and a 3.8 kilowatt inverter. Uh, for our solar panels, we have Hanwha Q cells. They are 340 watt panels and we have 36 of them mounted. Now, it was installed in August of 2021, however, it had some teething issues when it was installed and it wasn't actually operational until September 3rd. Uh, now, that being said, we didn't have permission to operate or PTO until late October. When PG&E and Tesla say it takes 68 weeks to process a interconnection agreement, they're not kidding. It takes a full month and a half to two months. It does take a really long time. Now, I'm not gonna go over all the data details for the two year anniversary here in this video. I'm gonna save those for a separate video that's coming out later. Right now, I'm gonna focus on month to month cost here. Uh, so basically, we're gonna look at our loan payments here. Now, what I will tell you is that we don't pay any charges to PG&E other than our connection fee that's about $11 a month. So that runs about $130 a year. So that's the negative, that's what we pay out. What we get in the first year, we got a true up check, which is your yearly roundup of all your net energy metering credits that they pay you for if you have excess. And we got roughly $290 from that true up check. We also received a virtual power plant check here for $575 in March. That was for the 2022 season. So net year one, we're positive $735. Now, that being said, going into the second year, I expect it to be about a 50% decrease uh, in our income. I think that virtual power plants basically were just utilized at the bare minimum this year, so we're not gonna get back nearly as much as we did then. We also, with Charge On Solar and trying to charge the cars here a bit more, have been utilizing a lot more of our electricity behind the meter, so I expect that our true up check is gonna be a lot less. I'm gonna estimate that basically we're gonna get $400 in checks uh, between the true up and the virtual power plant. And with the connection fees of $130 for the year, that leads us to about $270 positive. So that's $1,000 positive in two months. Now our system runs $400 per month for a payment. We were lucky enough in August or you know July of 2021 to land 0.99% financing and 10% down. So our system cost was about $53,000 before all the incentives, we had a down payment with that 10% of about $5,300 right away. Two years of payments on top of that, $400 per month, 12 months is $9,600 for two years or $4,800 a year. That's $14,900 out of our pockets in two years. Ouch, that's really expensive, right? But don't forget the federal tax credit. Everything that I'm mentioning is before the federal tax credit. When I installed it in 2021, it was only 26%. But since then, it's actually increased up to 30% with a new bill. Lucky for you if you haven't installed your system yet. And I believe that that 30% credit, uh, it stays there for quite a while. I, I think it's into 2030 or so. It might even be a little bit beyond that. For our system, our cost was about $53,000 for the system. We got roughly 13, 14 grand in a tax credit. So that really helps out. So let's look at the calculations here. In the past two years, we spent $14,900 out of pocket for loan payments and with uh, the utility costs and $13,780 back in a tax credit plus the $1,000 that the system earned for itself. So the net cost to us actually was only $120. We essentially paid an average of about $5 a month for our system so far for two years. 
Now, Tesla also shows you the energy value of your system. And what this is, is it's calculating what your energy or electricity would have cost had you paid PG&E or your utility rates when you used it at that time. For us, that shows with PG&E for the past two years a, a savings of $11,787. Let's break that down a little bit further. Basically, that $11,787 is saying that we would have paid PG&E roughly $500 a month for the last two years for the same electricity. Now, keep in mind, we're a two EV family, so electricity is also a fueling cost for us. So we're actually getting rid of you know, those gas station receipts, etc., by bundling that into our solar cost here. So for us, it was actually cheaper with a system payment of $400 a month versus pay, paying PG&E roughly $500 a month, you know, and not getting anything from it, it's actually cheaper to go sustainable. So by going solar, we were actually able to put effectively $100 in our pockets every single month. Now, I know you're probably complaining that interest rates aren't anywhere near where they used to be, and that's pretty true. I mean, on the other hand, the federal tax credit has also increased by 4%. So it's offsetting a good chunk of the interest savings. You know, I got 0.99. If you're financing now, I'm sure it's somewhere up in the 6 or 7% range. Now, I actually went on Tesla's website recently because I kept on getting emails from them saying, hey, you know, the uh, cost for systems is going down. You should really check it out. There's some Powerwall discounts going on. So I went ahead and looked at that. And uh, I'm, I'm sure they're also trying to get some Powerwalls out the door before the new Powerwall 3s are produced in earnest. So here we have the uh, order agreement that I signed for our system back in June of 2021. You can see 12.24 kilowatt panels, three Powerwalls. We also paid about $800 extra for an inside the attic conduit run instead of running it over the house. Um, as you can see there, 27,000 was the panels. 23,500 for the power walls are about 7,800 each. That's $53,124. Now, here's me signing into Tesla today and comparing the closest system that I can match up here. Now, this is 12.555 kilowatt, which is a couple hundred extra watts, but it's also this three power walls. Now, the panels are up about $3,000 here to $30,000, and the power walls are at $24,400 each, or $8,133, which is up about $300 each. Minus the um, SREC credit that you get back at the very beginning, that's $53,700 for a system now compared to $53,124 two years ago. Now you can see that the installation costs differ between the 2021 and the 2023 system, but the price difference really only is $600 before all the federal tax credits. Now keep in mind with that tax credit in 2021, it was 26% for me. In 2023, that's up to 30%. You've also got to keep in mind that interest rates have increased then. We had 0.99, it's probably up in the six or 7% range now. So it all kind of balances out. They're really relatively similar in cost. Now, if you're interested in ordering a system, Tesla has continued the $500 off a solar panel or solar roof system. So all you have to do is put in that $100 refundable deposit, have them come out, do a site assessment, check everything out. Basically, I think you're gonna find that Tesla is the cheapest for solar out there. So I'd say have them come out and look at it. That $100 is completely refundable until you accept the design. And then once you've accepted the design, you only have $100 in it until it passes city inspection. It's really worth it to have Tesla come out and take a look. With that being said, let's take a look at the data for this month. Now let's take a look at the data for September. Now in August, we used 2060.5 kilowatt hours. In September, that was down quite a bit to 1434.1 kilowatt hours. In August, that was an average of about 66 kilowatt hours per day being used. In September, that was down to 48 kilowatt hours or about a 25% decline. Now you always hear me talking about that sweet spot with the temperature in the AC and production. We've basically hit that spot where the temperatures are in the 70s. We're able to turn the AC off and with production going down, that allows us to send a little bit you know, more back to the grid. However, we are still getting those high 80s, low 90 days occasionally. So we're gonna have to turn the AC on here. Those days I would expect we're just not gonna fill the power walls up with our low production numbers as the fall continues on here. Now, 
looking back at the section before, I talked about fueling costs, you know, being included in our electricity cost. So here is with our Model Y and our Model 3, we charged it 450 kilowatt hours at home this month. It's about 25 kilowatt hours less than last month. Probably just didn't drive as much. But remember where I said it's part of that cost? So if you used uh, PG&E's cheapest rate that we have is 38 cents off peak, multiply that by that 450 kilowatt hours, you get $170. Basically fueling our EVs at home on the solar, it, it basically saves us that $200 and makes essentially half of our payment. That's pretty cool. Now last year in September we used 1330.3 kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hours within about 100 kilowatt hours of last year. It keeps in line with our usual 10% or so increase or decrease. I don't really know that anything special happened last year compared to this year. I do see there's a lot of gray on the graph. So to me, that's just you know a whole bunch of virtual power plant events. They really don't affect house usage. The only difference that we sometimes make is that we turn the AC up during the event and then turn it down afterwards. But again, that really shouldn't affect our house usage overall. Mainly, I just uh, attribute this 100 kilowatt or so increase to just charging at home more this year. Now, next up, we'll take a look at solar production. For August, that was 1,878.7 kilowatt hours. In September, that's down to 1,513.8 kilowatt hours. To put this into perspective, in July, we produced an average of 71 kilowatt hours per day. In August, that was down to 60 kilowatt hours. And in September, now that's at 50 kilowatt hours. You can expect this to continue basically until we get to that shortest day in December. We actually produce about 25 to 30 kilowatt hours on our best days in December. So you're gonna continue to see that decline until the days start getting longer here. Now, September this month was a pretty good month here in terms of production. You can see it's just mostly a gradual decline over the course of the month. Um, now, last year in September though, you can see we produced 1435.8 eight kilowatt hours and this is now our second month in a row if you remember august last month that we produced more this year than we did last year now this month we produced about 80 kilowatt hours more than we did in september last year and you can really see just what the effect that sunny weather has on solar production numbers so for August, our power walls discharged 747.4 kilowatt hours. In September, that was 595.8 kilowatt hours. In September, the you know average daily use is basically going down to about 20 kilowatt hours or less than half of our capacity. Again, with the solar production numbers, I'll put this into perspective. In July, we were using about 28 kilowatt hours per night. Uh, in uh, August, it was 25 kilowatt hours. And now it's about 20 kilowatt hours. So we still were never getting to the, you know, very extremes of the power walls, but we were using quite a bit during the summer, but now we'll go back to using not as much. Now looking at September of last year, we discharged 710.4 kilowatt hours uh, compared to the 595.8 discharge this month. Quite simply, this 20% or so decrease is due to the lack of virtual power plant events. Last year in September, we had those 110 degree days for I think it was a week and a half, and we basically had a week or so of straight virtual power plant events. Unfortunately, this year they've utilized it to the exact minimum of the program, the 20 hours, and so we're just not discharging our power walls as much. Um, you know, if we're not going to discharge for a virtual power plant event, it's just going to be our normal use for the night, so they're just not going to get used as much. Now, something I do want to point out here that's a little bit different than previous months is I think there might be some sort of bug or they updated something in the gateway firmware because basically you can see for the month of September here, about 10 days into it, we started getting these grid discharges, you know, of it looks like a couple kilowatt hours per day. Now, I don't know if these are accurate or not, and that's actually what we're sending back or if this is just a glitch. But basically, this makes it so that those grid numbers for the virtual power plant where I used to be able to look and see like, hey, this is what we're going to get compensated pretty easily um, is no longer easy because these numbers kind of cloud those numbers. Uh, I hope they fix that soon. Maybe there's going to be a, a release you know, soon. I guess we'll see on that one. Um, but with that being said, here is another month with our power walls with no power outages. Again, PG&E, congratulations. We haven't had an unplanned outage since April, and our neighbors actually did have a huge tree branch come down last week. 
bunch of chainsaws going and everything, but thankfully it missed the power lines and just hit the data and communications in the middle. So no uh, electricity interruption there for us. And now for my favorite part, the net grid use numbers. Now in August, we had kind of an odd month. We were 303.3 kilowatt hours imported from the grid, despite it being the summer and us having you know heavy production numbers at the end of the summer. Now in September, we fixed that and we were at net negative 2.1 kilowatt hours, or we sent back 2.1 kilowatt hours to the grid. Now we're nearing that sweet spot with the AC, um, you know, as the temperatures come down, but we are still, you know, using the AC some if the temperatures go up to the 90s. So October will be interesting. I'm not sure if we're gonna draw from the grid or if we'll, in, uh, you know, send back to the grid, but we'll just have to see. Now, looking back at September of last year, we used 18.2 kilowatt hours that we imported from the grid. We really only used the grid after those virtual power plant events. You can see the big gray splotches there. Uh, at the beginning of the month, we were having those 110 plus degree days for a week straight. Now, towards the end of the month, you can also see last year where the, um, we started to draw from the grid. Essentially, that's where our production starts to drop off if we have some weather or other you know, cloudy days. And so we'll start to see those days you know, more commonly here towards the end of the year. Our production numbers are down and just, you know, we won't use as much for AC, but if we have to charge the car or do something else energy intensive, we're probably gonna end up using the grid. So that being said, we are at 77% self-powered this month. That's up from 74% last month. That's 41% from solar this month compared to 40% last month. 36% from power walls compared to 34% last month. And now the grid numbers. It was 8% in July, 26% in August, and it's now 23% in September. Like I said last month, I try to be as self-powered as possible, but in these cases where it's convenient, I'm just gonna use the grid because it's there, it works, and we have a ton of net energy metering credits. So I hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you again next month for the newest update. I uh, hope you have a good one. Enjoy. Hi, mom and dad.